Hello, everyone. Welcome again to Conversations with Tyler. Today, I am very pleased to be chatting with Edwidge Dantica, the famed Haitian American author, also winner of a MacArthur Genius Fellowship. And uh, Edwidge, thank you for coming on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I have so many questions. Let's start with one about you. Now, you moved to the United States from Haiti, I believe, when you were 12. How is it you have learned so much about Haitian history in, since you didn't do most of your schooling in Haiti? Well, I, I often say that, you know, and my parents used to say it as well, that I left Haiti, but Haiti didn't leave me. Um, and 12 is, I think, young enough to transition somewhat easily, but also uh, to have formed so many memories and to have actually have had a you know, I had actually had a big chunk of um, like primary education in Haiti and having learned both oral history and, and written history. So I brought a lot of that with me to the U.S. and enough that I was curious when I got here to, to find out more from this side of things. So um, I think it was part in part a love uh, for Haiti that continued and also a curiosity about history in general, but uh, Haitian history in particular. Now, there's a shift, I think, in Haitian cultural history. If you think of the 1960s or 70s, Haitian cultural history is centered in Haiti. So you have Mick Jagger, Jacqueline Kennedy, Onassis. They go to Port-au-Prince, Petionville. They, they buy paintings. They bring them back. Uh, everything is very Haitian-centered. And that seems to end in the 1980s. Why did that happen? Well, yeah, there was a, a time, even in the, the, you know, in the 50s, where you had cruise ships going to Haiti, which I've always found somewhat interesting because all that time that you had that, you know, the tourism, uh, the sort of that high level of tourism was still doing the dictatorship. And so people were going at that time anyway, the folks you mentioned and others, um, and then in the 1980s, uh, during the uh, AIDS uh, epidemic, you know, the, that, the pandemic of, of AIDS, then um, Haiti was um, designated as, by the, by the uh, CDC uh, as uh, Haitians were uh, labeled a high-risk group for AIDS. And, and uh, we were the only ones uh, designated by nationality. It was uh, Haitians homophiliacs, heroin addicts, and homosexuals. And, um, and so that certainly, uh, that came out of a some cases of uh, uh, people who had contracted AIDS and who came to a hospital here in Miami and were reported to the CDC. Uh, and so that killed really, that designation killed the tourism um, industry uh, in Haiti. Uh, it was later, you know, after much, you know, demonstrations, after uh, a lot of research, it was corrected, um, but it really it killed whatever uh, tourism industry uh, there was in Haiti, which was already kind of a strange kind of tourism anyway, because, you know, if people felt like happy to go at a time of, you know, very strict dictatorship, that there was always already something uh, a little strange about that, but but whatever tourism industry there was was destroyed by the AIDS epidemic. But if you, if you think of Haitian culture today, is it correct to think that the Haitian diaspora is now Haitian culture? So if you think of Haitian painting, well, there's Duval Carrier, but he's lived in Puerto Rico, in France, in Florida. Uh, you are the leading Haitian writer, if one were going to call you that. Wycliffe Jean from Haiti but now mostly in North America, Leila Makala, some would even call Basquiat a Haitian artist. I mean, is that now outside of Haiti what Haitian culture is? No, I think, I think that, would be, um, that would be incorrect to, to say because there is still such a, there is a great uh, vibrant uh, culture and inside Haiti, and there are wonderful writers inside Haiti as well. There's wonderful visual artists, musicians. Um, and so I think if you think of it like any other diaspora, you know, and, and um, 
there is sort of, uh, we're going to be like, if you're in North America or if you're out, you know, you're, there's some mechanisms that make that, you know, our work more visible. My work is in English. So naturally uh, people uh, have more access to it, like more easily, but there's a, a really strong and vibrant um, culture inside Haiti as well that people like us, you know, um, we feel fed by, you know, that we feel is still, still uh, important to us, you know, as, as readers, you know, I'm, I'm a writer, but I'm also a reader. I'm in a, you know, I appreciate art. I'm, you know, I'm on the, on the council of the Sancho Dar in Haiti, an esteemed um, institution that goes back, you know, several uh, decades now. So there is, there's still that culture and, and it's, it's really a, a, a powerful statement, I think, to, um, to Haitians and Haitian culture because there's so many obstacles uh, all the time in the way of artists in Haiti, but they, you know, they still are thriving and, and are very, really wonderful, uh, express what's happening uh, very powerfully through their work. Do you think the Haitian diaspora is culturally stable or do you think it will in essence be absorbed and assimilated into more narrowly Afro-American culture? Well, I think because the, the Haitian diaspora has, uh, because there's often so much happening in Haiti, let's say, that tie, you know, what we would call that long bleed, you know, the umbilical cord is really married to Haiti. Um, and even over several generations, like, the, you know, the Haitians, uh, who I know, I don't want to speak for everybody, remain very connected to Haiti and want their children to know Haiti um, and want that connection through language, through food, through music. So the diaspora, um, you know, no diaspora is fully stable. There's, of course, there's integration, there's assimilation, there's, that happens with every immigrant community over the generations, certainly for sure. Um, but there's a certain tie to, to Haiti that the diaspora has, that there's so many diaspora organizations that neighborhood organizations where people support, you know, schools and the neighborhoods where they come from, where they support organizations. There's, and, and part of it, I think that tie, that connection is connected to the fact that there is, that Haiti is off, often in crisis and, um, and people in the diaspora are often the first line responders, right? And uh, after people in Haiti, inside Haiti, you know, after Haitians in Haiti, but the Haitian diaspora, um, even in, within our families, if there's an illness, if there's, you know, and that sometimes extends to the larger community. So I think there will be um, over, you know, I, I definitely there's, there's integration, you know, I think, um, but I don't see, I think we have a diaspora that goes back, you know, further than people know, yet, yet that connection to Haiti throughout the generations has remained. And, and then with these artists that you mentioned, you know, Lila Makala is, you know, is, she's a wonderful artist born of Haitian parents, yet her music reflects um, that. Uh, artists like Melissa Lavo, you know, you mentioned Bastia. I think those, you know, that, that's also a kind of testament to the thread that runs to Haiti um, in the diaspora. Do you think there is in fact a natural language for Haitian literature? So if you think of the earlier Haitian classics that you've had a hand in translating, they were written in French. Your work, of course, is written in English. It's been slow to have been translated into Creole. Is it a fundamental fact about the future of Haitian literature that there, there's not a natural language there? Well, I mean, I, it's, it's such a, um, a topic of discussion often among critics of Haitian literature. Um, what language is Haitian literature written in? And I, and I think now people, you know, like I have, I mean, most people, I mean, some people, I can't speak for everyone, but I think most people will, who study Haitian literature will say that it's now a, a multilingual literature. Um, there's literature in Creole, certainly, which I, it's probably closer to the language, to, to, you know, to the primary language that most Haitians speak Creole. 
Um, and that was slow to come. There was always li literature in Creole, but not as much as there is now. Um, French was probably, you know, was literature, Haitian literature is mostly written in French. And like you said, we worked on translating. Um, I've worked with others in translating, uh, for example, uh, a masterpiece of Haitian literature called Les Pasteur Simon by Jacques Stephen Alexis, which we translated with uh, Carol Coates as um, In the Flicker of an Eyelid. And I edited these two books, Haiti Noir and Haiti Noir Two, in which we, con we translated many contemporary Haitian writers. So, um, and then we have writers now who are Haitian American or Haitian Canadian, um, like uh, Raxan Gay and Miriam Chansi who write directly in English. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a literature now that's, a, it's a kind of multi-language literature through my, you know, immigration and migration. And there, we have writers who are writing in Chile, in the Dominican Republic, uh, in Spanish, um, and that's another uh, growing layer of, of uh, Haitian literature abroad, you know, that the Haitian literature um, that's so far mostly produced a lot of poetry in Spanish. Um, but there was a novel before by a Haitian writer named Micheline Dussek, who, was, who had written one of the first um, novels about Haiti in Spanish. So it's a growing, I mean, it's, it's very, it's a linguistically interesting um, literature and to, to see all the like of the tentacles of it, if you will. What do you think of the, you might call them outsider novels about Haiti? So there's Graham Greene, there's Victor Hugo's Bug Jargle, right, which is about the Haitian Revolution. Are those cultural appropriation? Are they bad novels? How do they strike you? Some are good, you know, some are bad. There's some, you know, there's some wonderful ones like um, Madison Smart Bell's trilogy. Um, also was rising, you know, in the Haitian Revolution. I think that those were wonderful. Um, I mean, I, 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 there's some really great ones. There's some that are a little cringy. <laughs> um, but I, I wouldn't say to anybody that you can't write about, you know, again, you can't write about any, I mean, I think, I think really writers should be able to write whatever they want. Um, you should, uh, expect people to respond. And I think, you know, if you do it with um, nuance um, and care, that's, that's really important. I mean, they're, they're, the temptation, you know, there are some tropes that often sometimes people just fall into when they're writing about Haiti, the, the zo zombie situation, um, you know, and they sometimes they approach it like it's never been done before. <laughs> um, so I, I think, you know, they're, they're, if you do it with care, if you do it with nuance, um, I, 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 you know, I'm open to, to reading it, you know. Why does Haiti have the very best food in the Caribbean? Well, because we just do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm a little, I, I'm perhaps biased, you know, and, I, and I, I just have to say overall in the Caribbean, we have a, amazing food, you know, there's wonderful food throughout the Caribbean. Um, but I think Haitian food in particular, I love because of, we have great spices. And even, you know, if the food is a little fad in some cases, you have like the piquis, which is um, sort of a, a pickled cabbage, carrots, like a, a spice, um, a, you know, that, that you, sprinkle on top, you know, um, if for people who like meat, there's grillo, which is pork, tasso, goat, um, and, and there's stuff that even if you're vegan, you can like, like my moulin, which is um, cornmeal, there's, I think it's a very rich and wonderful um, cuisine, but I am biased. And, and I think if people who have not had Haitian food, you should definitely if you know anybody who's Haitian on January 1st, go over their house for, when we can go over people's houses again, go for soup jumu, which is a squash soup that we drink on the 1st of January to celebrate Haitian independence. Why is Haitian black mushroom rice so good? Ah, uh, it's the mushroom, that's the, that's the key. And, and actually, you know, I've had, I live in Miami and 
that gives me a little more access to uh, the John John. And so I've had to ship to friends throughout the, <laughs> throughout the States. Um, and there's a key to it in terms of just how you um, like washing the, the mushroom and, and just the right, they try to make a kind of like cube thing, but the cube thing is just not the same as just like the actual mushroom that you boil and you squeeze. And, and if you ever, like some people, if you're from the North, like my friends from the North will put some cashews in that. That's like another level with some cashews. The collective buses in Haiti, the tap taps, of course, why are they so beautifully painted? Why does that make economic sense? Well, the thing is, I mean, it's um, people who, like, I, and I've gone to Haiti with a lot of uh, blanc, you know, foreigners uh, at some like point. Like me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when there's a, a time when um, I used to go, we had a, a program for college students every summer. And, um, and I used to love like when, when they land to see the tap taps. So it's just really, it's so, it's so striking because it just feels like, oh, I'm in this world full of art, you know? And it's like, they, they seem to be moving canvases. And what I love personally most about tap tap, even after you get used to the, to the visual feast that they are, I love the sayings on them. And, um, and I used to, and you would see like, you know, uh, like of course, basketball stars from here. I mean, I think at some point, like not too long ago, like, there was like Toni Morrison after she died was on a tap tap. Um, it just, you know, people really soak what's happening um, around, but the sayings are also great. So there's one of my favorite sayings on the tap tap was, wapale um, mapdravai, like, you're you're just you're talking and I'm working like and I felt like it was so powerful in terms of like how like how you respond to to sort of people who talk badly about you. It's like wapale mapgavai. You know, you're talking, I'm walking. You know, I'm working. <laughs> so and then things like that. And that's just really and also the tap taps would on the with the art sometimes like will have messages of gratitude like. So, so a tap tap might have a, a message of gratitude to the driver's mother or to whoever like contributed. A lot of them are, you know, to the Jesus, to God, to the Virgin and, and other religious figures, but also to people in the, the, the person's life who contributed to the business. And so it's really, a, a, I, I always find them very uh, beautiful to look at, but also really wonderful moving like moving pieces of art. If I think of the Haitian arts today, I think of painting possibly as having peaked between the 40s and the 70s. And the most interesting work today tends to be in voodoo sculpture. Why has that shift come about? And those are very large pieces. They're like installations. They're hard to buy. They're hard to transport. Well, I think, I, I think that, I think if you, Stay there, you would be reducing like your your possible level of enjoyment, right? Because uh, what's most in the in the that early period, you know, the Santuidar period in the '40s, like the early period where uh, when the tourism that you were talking about, when people went to Haiti, they what they bought the most was what they called the like the naive primitive art, which is a super colorful, really beautiful figures, often market scenes. And um, so that, that traveled very well. But there was always at that same time artists who are a little bit more adventurous, artists who are like somewhat abstract. Um, at the same time that there were these artists who were like, this is what the tourists want, that's what I'm going to produce, right? And so throughout the Caribbean, even if you went to other islands, you would see these paintings and, and they, they became almost a little bit mass produced, but they were, they were gorgeous. I have I have some, but um, the sculptures you're talking about, I think we, um, those were started actually um, by, uh, there was an, we used to call them, I used to work for Jonathan Demi, the, the filmmaker, yes. who was a huge collector of Haitian art. And in the office, when, whenever we acquired those sculptures, you know, when we bought, we traveled, I traveled a lot to Haiti with him. And when he would buy, he called them Leotos because 
the original artist was uh, Liu Tu, who, and you know, and when I was growing up in cemeteries often, you didn't, you, we had metal flowers really because you would do like a wreath of metal with, and it would be metal from oil drums because that lasted longer, right? As opposed to like, if you have a, a, a wreath of, of just like roses that dies quickly. So people would make these beautiful wreaths. And so Leoto was a great, he was in from St. Mark, which is really the, the home of these sculptures. And, um, and now there's a whole industry in, in those sculptures for sure. And, and I, have, I have to say like, they're very hard. I agree to, they, they can't, you can't just like put that in your suitcase often like you would the paintings the way people used to roll them. So, but they're, they're gorgeous. And now they're almost three dimensional, you know, like one Christmas we bought one that was like a, a nativity scene that was just um, like 3D. Um, but there are other, you know, there are a lot of wonderful young artists now um, that just, some of them are moving away from um, the, the sort of the more primitive, naive, um, you know, saint Eloi, there's, there, there's so many that, whose names are escaping me, but they're just wonderful artists worth exploring. You mentioned Duval Cahier, who is outside of Haiti, um, but there are quite a few other young artists who, who are inside Haiti or doing, who would use both their, that, that style of sculpture, but also do paintings, who do installations, or doing really, really um, exciting things. I own a Zobop by Leoto, by the way. Ah, uh, Great yes. work. It's by the yes. fireplace. Oh, wow. Yeah. Why is it you think that Black African Americans have not evolved as natural collectors of Haitian art. It seems to be much more the nerdy white guys who buy it, or well-to-do families. Oh, I know a lot of African Americans who collect Haitian art. You know, starting with, for example, uh, Ishmael Reed, um, who his wife had a gallery. You know, uh, people like Danny Glover. So, and and even you know friends that again. Um, when we traveled with um, folks to Haiti, a lot of them were African American, and uh, oh, I know there are quite a few African American collectors. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't know uh, my friend uh, Karine Fabius, who has a gallery in LA called Gal Galerie Lacai, um, and she has, you know, she has quite. Uh, it's it's a wonderful gallery because it's in their home. Her husband, Pascal, is an artist who's worked with the artists in Grand Rue, who, who do actually a really amazing urban uh, sculptures with, um, you know, discarded like dolls and computer boards and sometimes skulls. Um, they recently had a show here at MoCA. And, um, and Karin, for example, has, I think has worked with a lot of African-American collectors, including, you know, some in Hollywood, but some in, um, outside of, of also, you know, ordinary people who, who collect as well. I mean, there's, there's been, uh, you know, like, I think also this marriage of African-American art in some cases with Haitian art, like uh, Lori Malu Jones, who went to Haiti, uh, who, you know, who has spent time there and, and kind of this, this connection there with, with some African-American artists who, who are very aware of Haitian art at, as well. How much voodoo inspiration is there in your writing? Um, well, I, I, it's part of the, you know, of the Haitian culture and it's, a, you know, and, um, I try one of the things that when you were asking about the outside gaze of on um, on the Haitian uh, in Haitian literature, I I think sometimes it's easy like to fall into that trap of like oh let me throw in um, some vodou just to like you know exotify things. So I try to in my in my work I tried you know I treat that as a worldview as um, and you know, some people might be practitioners, some people might not be, you know, and I also like to show a whole range of religious practices in my characters because not everybody is monolithic, you know, just in their, just as they're not in 
their behavior. They're not monolithic in their religious practice as well. So uh, I try to show it as a whole range of religious practice, uh, like in Breath Eyes Memory, for example, you know, the family certainly has, you know, they have their, their family loa, they have, you know, they have things that they have their own practice, but they also, you know, their members of the family also practice other religions. So like the, so to, to show the whole range of, like a, of, of religious practices that there would be in a family like that, some of them also, you know, Protestant and, um, and, and, and sometimes that actually leads to some conflicts within some families. So I like to show the, the whole, all the nuance of, 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 of all that. Your novel about the twins, Untwine, isn't that just a voodoo novel? And I mean that as praise. Um, I mean, I, I didn't think of it that way. I didn't start, a, um, there's certainly, you know, there's certainly twin loas in, um, in um, voodoo. Um, and these girls are twins. I had always been fascinated by twins. Um, but I, 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 I don't think I, you know, that I, I think maybe that could be one interpretation, but that wasn't, I mean, it would be kind of, um, yeah, I, I just, I, that wasn't sort of how I, and, you know, I, I started out, but I, I think that could be one interpretation, uh, you know. To me, I just think Marasa when I'm reading it, right? The whole myth of the twins and rivalry and beginning, the end, struggle. Yeah, but I think if you, um, uh, is, it, is it because they're Marasa? Because there are a lot of novels about twins as well that are written by, uh, you know, by people who are not from Haiti. Like I said, I think I, I, I don't object to that as an interpretation. But I don't think that's that's the only thing that it is. As you know, it's also about you know sisterhood and you know, and and illness and separation and so forth. But but again, I you know I'm fine with that interpretation. <laughs> In a world with so much mobile and social media, do you think radio is still of central importance for Haitian politics, as it had been in the past? Um, I think. Uh, it remains, um, radio remains very important there. For example, there are a lot of, you know, cultural figures, um, even younger people um, in Haiti who emerged out of radio culture and now, now have transitioned into more social media, you know, who do uh, lives and Facebook and, but who started out in radio. I mean, radio certainly was very important when I was growing up and, um, there weren't as many other outlets. But now I find, for example, you know, my mother-in-law who's 85, who lives with us, she's in Haiti most of the time, but she, in addition to, you know, the, the, sometimes she'll watch a YouTube um, video about something that's happening in Haiti, but it will be, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a YouTube video of someone in a radio station and she can watch that on YouTube. Someone can send the clip on WhatsApp. So I, I think radio now is part of a series of like many different ways that people get information. Um, it remains like when we're in the country, um, if you don't have internet, it remains one way that you get news on the radio. You know, um, it's, uh, but it's also people also I find like even the older people in my life get a lot of news through their phones, through WhatsApp, you know, through also through YouTube clips. And so it, there's a constant loop of information now that radio is just one part of. Whereas, for example, when I was younger, it would be um, it would just be it was prime. It was the primary, if not the only source of information that we had when we were. With a Haitian background, do you think you have a different perspective on the fake news debates of the United States? Because Haiti, it seems, had a lot of fake news well before social media. It was a kind of country of rumor in some ways, or not. Well, I think you're, you're thinking of this whole thing of uh, uh, 
maybe that expression tele jol which is like the mouth that would go i guess would be like tele um and that was a way that information is spread i i think i don't know i i i think every culture has that kind of um sort of rumor mill if you will i don't think that that would be unique to to haitians um i think what we do what i, I what i recognize in the whole fake news debate is the um sort of the the gradual slide towards autocracy <laughs> um certainly that is um i i that is those of us who have lived through dictatorship and other uh, moments like that you recognize the slippery slope the you know the sort of the um demonization of media the you know the just sort of forced silencing it's you know the, this the the summer i was reading with my girls we were reading animal farm and um and it was just really striking you know so sort of like the the all the parallels in terms of like what your eyes are seeing you're not seeing so all that is very familiar in terms of like that whole thing of 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 diminishing the press of course at full autocracy you you know at full then you kind of destroy the people who are giving the news um but there are ways now with with you know with the social media to to do it why do you think haitian political history has shown so much instability in terms of turnover and the number of rulers um well you know i think haiti's history started we started as a country with everything against us right the haitian revolution was an impossibility to so many people um so these enslaved people fought the french the british the you know the spanish and to make to to start the first black republic the first place in the world really where enslaved people overcame their masters and started this nation in a world where uh slavery was the norm so haiti was you know stop you know shunned and um and they had we had to pay uh, to the french for this independence until into the next century and so i i i think there was so much you know stacked uh, against us and then you know in the 19 early 1900s you had the very long us occupation and then the dictatorship so i i think the it's just we were set up in a way to fail because this you know was not meant to exist and slave people starting their own country was not meant to exist it's kind of you know a lot of people have said it and historians and ha have said it like how dare you and i think to this day uh, haiti is being told how dare you and 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 many instances when people you know when they've elected their own um when they've elected their leaders when we've elected our leaders then suddenly there's a coup or there's so i think the instability is not fully um the fault of 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 Haitians i mean we've had our part where people who have you know who sort of have decided to turn against their own uh but there's but it's also something that has been set up to you know to fail what did the united states get most wrong in its 1915 to 1934 occupation of haiti being there <laughs> um sure but there's better and worse <laughs> occupations right oh i don't i don't think the people who have been um occupied anywhere would ever say that they are like oh what a great occupation um because but say but Barbados may have gone better than say some other countries in the Caribbean its occupation. Um I would ask I you know I would I, I would ask the Barbadi I mean I think you mean Grenada or well or, that Grenada also yeah. I, Say I mean, they've been better than Suriname. 
the Dutch were more extractive in Suriname than the British were in Barbados? Um, I, think. I, I would ask them. I don't, I don't know. I would, ask, I would not speak for them. I think, um, I think people always want to be in charge of their fate. And, and the people who come often, you know, I, I can only, from what I know of the U.S. occupation, it wasn't. Um, and, and, you know, the writers at that time wrote about it. You know, there were like African-American scholars who were living the moment, who visited, who, who, who wrote about it, because it was meant to keep, um, it was meant for influence in the region. And, you know, and um, there's uh, one of the uh, heads, uh, I've, I think Butler, uh, his name was, who wrote about, uh, who had a mea culpa many years later, who was in charge of not just the occupation of Haiti, but also when at that time where there was a common occupation of Haiti in the DR, where he said, you know, we were there for the, for City Corp. We were there for money. Like he, that was his mea culpa. He was like, he, and so, um, and for example, you know, people, there is the example of, and, you know, you've talked about Haitian art with um, Philomé Aubin, who's a, a Haitian artist from the, the North, has a very famous painting about Chalmaz Peyrat, who was a leader of the uh, uh, Cacos, who fought against the occupation, who was murdered and attached to a door for, you know, as a kind of uh, frightening and and there were some horror stories, some massacres during the, uh, the occupation. And what was left, I mean, the, uh, what was left behind after the occupation, I think both in Haiti and the Dominican Republic, was this military structure, right, that went through the generations. And the Dominican Republic side, it became Trujillo, who then carried out this 1937 massacre of Haitians, uh, and then on our side, it went all the way through, down through the, the army that, the, the, that ended up in that dictatorship. And, and there was also sort of a deeper layering of sort of just basically moving Jim Crow to these islands because then they had to, you know, for the comfort of these people, they had to kind of create these clubs, these sort of to separate people who are light versus people who are dark in terms of how they're interacted with them. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not fun. <laughs> in retrospect, do you think the U.S. restoration of Aristide in 1994 was a mistake? Was it more colonialism? Or was it the best thing that somehow had to be done? Well, I think that was a very uh, difficult moment at that time. Um, I, and, I, and there was those generals um, in that moment had, uh, you know, doing that, that coup d'etat, uh, thousands and thousands of people had been killed. Um, at that time, I worked, I was working on a film called um, Tombé les and we were interviewing uh, many people who had been uh, victimized by the, by doing the, the coup d'etat. And one of them was a, an incredibly brave woman named Alain Bélance, who had survived and being really butchered and had lost her arm and other people. And so I think, I think at that time, I mean, the, you know, President Aristide was part of that decision and he wanted, uh, he wanted to return. At that time, I guess, uh, that was the, the right thing to do because people were really, and the generals, they were ready to stay and, um, and people were dying. And so, you know, I, looking back, I, you know, I think that that probably was a really, that was the decision that was made in prison. I stayed and he, he returned. If you were minister of education in Haiti and had a fair amount of latitude, what would you do? Um, I would, uh, you know, I, I would give the job to, to a woman I know who runs an organization called Aseye Pwaiti. And her name is uh, Nejin. Um, and Nejin uh, works with um, schools. Actually, she works with educators. 
Um, I would get people, I, if I were minister, I, I, first of all, I would make sure people who are better qualified than me were minister of education. But I would, um, one thing I think would be important I, to actually make sure every, every single child is educated and to make sure that uh, Creole is part of the education. It's, it's like that there is education um, in Creole because often um, children just jump into school in French and it's, uh, and, and there's a lot of rote memorization. Um, so I would, I would just, uh, that would be an important thing, I think, to make sure every child has access to education because in Haiti, uh, something like a parent's 40, uh, something like 40% of a parent's income is spent on education and often not the, you know, the children are not getting the best education um, because they're, it's a rote memorization and, and um, but what I know is um, there's such a love for education in Haiti that, that parents really, really sacrifice a great deal to have their children educated that, um, that every child, of course, uh, deserves an education. So I, would, I think it, I would love um, for every child to have that opportunity. I think that would be the, the most important thing to have a, like a good education that could serve them and, and, and help them to function and grow um, in, their, in, in their country. As a Haitian American, how do you feel your perspective on Black Lives Matter might be different from that of many Black Americans? It's not different. I think um, I believe that Black Lives Matter, of course, and um, and I think maybe as a you know as a Haitian American with the history that I've just outlined to you, you know, with having come out of a culture of revolution, you know, and, and the constant fight that Haitians have always had, we can certainly um, identify with that, absolutely. Um, and one thing that's been really wonderful to see um, with this generation is that uh, as Black immigrants, we can, um, we, you know, there's no separation, I think, um, Maybe in previous generations, you know, there was that feeling that, oh, this is not my problem. But, you know, in the demonstrations, you see Haitian flags, you see Dominican flags, you see, you know, uh, people from the continent. And um, I think because we realize that this affects all of us, you know, and, and um, it's, it's um, my nephews, it's my you know, the, my African-American friends that I grew up with, their children, my children, it's, it's, a, it's a common, it's certainly a common struggle. And certainly, you know, if that cop is not gonna be asking you which country you're from, you know, when, when doing these types of encounters. Now, in all of these conversations, there's a segment where I present to the guest uh, my favorite Haitian proverbs and he or she reacts. Are you ready for a few? All right. So you have you you've been sharing Haitian proverbs with your guests. Here's one. After the dance, the drum is heavy. Oh my God! What I've, does that mean to you? Après das tamboulou. Um, so I actually have a book called After the Dance. Um, it's on carnival. Uh, yes, for me, it means that there are consequences to everything. Like even. Um, like even the most joyful thing, right? Like you have to be prepared for the consequences of, of things that you've done, you know? And it's something that, you know, my, like, if you, my mom used to say quite a bit too, like if you have just had a really big celebration or if you, you waited too late to do your homework because you were having a good time watching a program you like, she was like, I've read you know, after the dance, the drum is heavy. So there's always, it's kind of like the morning after hangover situation and the most joyful outcome, but, that, but really that there are consequences to everything. Here's another one. It is the owner of the body who looks out for the body. Oh, this one, you will not believe how much we hear that these days. 
Um, and, and it's something that we say a lot now in the coronavirus era. Um, and you hear it on the radio, you hear it, you know, people say it when they talk to their neighbors, that means that really the, you are the best uh, person to take care of yourself. Like, um, so like if you want people, if you're saying um, wear your mask when you go out doing the coronavirus era, um, wash your hands, it's like, like the best, the most qualified person to take care of you is you. So it's not the doctor, it's not, you know, your loved one. Semet uh, Kogveiko, it's the owner of the body who takes care of the body. So it's like, watch out for yourself. It's, it's very good advice these days. When they want to kill a dog, they say it's crazy. Yep, that's that, um, the um, dehumanization, um, you know, just those, like if you want to, um, what you do, it's, I guess it's fake news. <laughs> it's like, um, it, it's connected to the fake news, right? If you want to uh, diminish or slight someone, you just, you, you call them names. Um, so that's, uh, that's, a, that's a, also a, a, a timely one, I think. How about this one? The constitution is paper, the bayonet is steel. Yes. Um, again, uh, back to our conversation about, you know, uh, dictatorship in a way, I think, I believe that one was often cited by um, uh, one of the uh, generals actually during the, the 90s, during the, the, that coup d'etat, um, or it might have been even before, but it was, um, I think it speaks to the fragility of, of documents, right? Like the constitution, I think yesterday was constitution day in the US. Um, so that might also apply here, right? That if um, it's, it's that whole thing with freedom, right? It's freedom is something that is, is always, like we have to always keep watching out. It's not, doesn't slip away, right? Because uh, sometimes we, we, we think the, like these documents or these uh, rules or, on, you know, are just set in stone. And, and I remember, I think this, this general who kept saying this saying, was saying, well, you know, I have the weapons and, um, and we can all like with weapons, you know, paper, it's kind of paper, paper, rock, scissors, <laughs> and which is, <laughs> which is stronger. When the Mapu tree dies, goats would eat its leaves. Yes. Um, this one, I think, is about humility, um, because we, you know, we have this uh, expression that we say when uh, someone has died who has contributed a great deal to, to our culture, to the, we, we say that a mapu has fallen. And a mapu is a silk cotton tree. It's a, a kind of sacred tree. Um, and it's also a big tree that, that's sort of, that lasts uh, forever. And, um, so it's a, it's a regal, it's just a, it's an institution, a mapu. And so what this one is saying that even, you know, the, it's actually the goat is a kind of meager creature compared to a mapu. And there's no way a goat would actually be able to access the leaves to a mapu, but when it dies, it falls. And then it's, it's just saying that we're all, um, I think it's, I've always in, inter heard that proverb as a way to, of um, uh, encouraging humility, that we're sort of all vulnerable to, all our leaves are vulnerable to the goat, if you will. One more proverb, beyond the mountain is another mountain. Yes, demon gemon. Um, That's a very I, famous one. Yes, and I, I actually use that a lot myself. You know, um, I have a neighbor, one of my neighbors just passed away um, and she used to uh, use that proverb a lot. And so I think it means that um, no matter what, uh, we can see there's more. So I think it's, it's about there's more to everything we can actually, then there's more to everything than what we see. Um, it also speaks to the physical uh, layout of Haiti because uh, it's a very mountainous place, you know, IT and the Arawak called it IT. It actually means um, land of the mountains. 
And so, um, and, it, and it's physically true. Like if you're traveling across Haiti, literally, uh, there's always a mountain behind the, physically behind the mountain. But um, in, a, in a kind of spiritual sense, it also means that there's, there's, there's always more, you know. And, and you know, this, this, there's this mountain connected um, saying that I love, you know, um, which it says, deux mois ne pas jamais contrer, mais nous-mêmes peut-être un jour nous qu'à contrer, which means, um, and it's a great closer in a way, it means um, two mountains can never meet, but perhaps you and I, we can meet again. Have you ever been to West Africa? I have not. I have um, only been to um, South Africa. Um, and actually this year we were hoping to, to make a, a trip to different countries in Africa, but we're obviously not able to, but that is, um, I, I often feel like, you know, I'm 51 now. I feel like I should have already made it, but it's definitely, um, it's something that I've wanted to do with my, with my family, with my girls and, and that hopefully we'll get all to do to, together. What is special about Jacques Mel in Haiti? Um, Jacques Mel is, um, at one thing, there's a, a, a wonderful novel by a great Haitian writer, Lini Dipes, called Adriana in, um, in All My Dreams, which was recently translated by Kayama Glover. Um, and that novel will tell you everything <laughs> you want to know about Jack Mel. It's sort of a, it's a, it's a beautiful place, a physically like location. It's got both the mountains and the sea. It's got a wonderful um, waterfall called Bassin Bleu. It's a, it's a gorgeous uh, place uh, that it, and after the dance, uh, the book that I wrote, it's about carnival and Jacmel, and it has a spectacular um, carnival as well. And, and there's some wonderful artists uh, who live there actually, um, who I write about in um, After the Dance, one of them, Wunal Meuse, who, who still lives there next to a, a, a beautiful mountain there. Now, in your own life, how did you manage to be such a prodigy? So you come to the U.S., you're 12. You grew up speaking Creole, right? By the time you're 14, you're writing for something called New Youth Connections, perfectly fluently. And then your first book is published as an undergraduate. So what accounts for this? What's your own story about the beginnings of your own success? Well, uh, um, my first book actually was published when I was 24. That's still, that's still early, but I loved writing. I, I loved stories and I loved writing. And for me, it was always fun. And even when I was doing other things, I was, um, you know, studying at school, but I loved to write. And so, um, you know, it's that, that saying that people say, uh, it's, if you love what you do, you've never worked a day in your life. <laughs> so I, I, for me, that was just really, I, I wanted to write and it started with New Youth Connections, that uh, journal that I started writing for when I was 14 and went through um, all my books to this day. Uh, I never saw myself so much as, I mean, I knew uh, that my book was published early and, and a lot was made of that, I think, as when you publish when you're young. But for me, it was just always a joy. It was a, something I loved doing and I, I always felt like really blessed to be able to do it. And I still feel that way to today. What's your most productive or most unusual work habit? Um, working at night and as the older I'm getting, the harder it is to actually do to stay up all night. But I find that writing at night is my, is really my most productive time. Like, because somehow at night you just feel like everybody's, you know, safe in bed that I'm responsible for. And, and there's not too many distractions. The internet is always there, but it's, it's, it's just easier to imagine a whole other universe at night. So that's, I feel that that's when I'm most productive. So. And being a Haitian American writer, what criticisms do you feel you get from Haitians? Is there any tension there? 
Um, I, I think there's always attentions, um, but not so much because of um, the, the people who read me. I think, I think it's the same when you come, when you, and I, I have friends who, from other groups, it's the same. So you're, you seem to be plucked out of your group and people think like you consider yourself a representative. I've never considered myself a representative for Haitians or all Haitians. I don't think I speak for all Haitians, but often in the, you know, when you're spoken about in the press, like people put you as a kind of sociologist, as a kind of Haitian expert on Haiti. When, when I started pretty young and I really, it was like, I just want to tell this story. I want to tell that story. And then I started to realize that people were at times overgeneralizing my stories, right? Like that they would say, oh, this character in your book does that. And that's what all Haitians do. So of course, my, some of my compatriots didn't like that because they would say, you know, people would literally say to me like, oh, that person read your book and said that, like, they think that's my life too. So I think, and that happens, I think, with the work of, of, of writers of color a lot, you know, for example, Alice Walker, that people say, oh, because she writes this character, then she hates black men, or because, you know, that for me, they were saying, oh, because you wrote about this girl whose family really wanted to be a virgin, that means like, you know, everybody who's Haitian has the same situation. I think, I think the people in the, the mainstream culture sometimes generalize the, what we write, and so that leads to some tensions within, within you know, within the, the culture. Um, but I've had, you know, I've had some rebuke, which is normal. Again, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, there are circumstances to whatever you write, uh, whatever you do. And, um, and I learned from that. And, um, and I have to, um, I started out very young. So I think over the years, I've also had to learn and how to tell maybe more nuanced stories um, and how to be conscious of just how what I write will be read by, by not just, you know, by, by different types of people. Now you've taught a history of Haitian cinema class at Ramapo College, correct? What did um, you do in that? Well, actually that this, we taught that class when, um, with, I, it was Jonathan Demi and uh, a Haitian um, journalist, Jean Dominique. And when Jean was in exile from Haiti, um, Jonathan wanted to do actually a, a festival of Haitian cinema and uh, we used that class as a way of first of all finding um, the films um, that we would show and then to talk about them so um, we there's a, a Haitian film for example called Anita which is about a young girl who's a domestic servant in a home uh, who uh, Haitian singer T. Korn is uh, featured in it with a, and, and so we would get that film, we would show it and we'd talk about it. And Jean, who was more versed in Haitian cinema than either of us would uh, speak on it. And then the students would film it. So um, I, I hope all of this is in the archives at Ramapo College, but it was both a, a, a history of cinema class but also a a class when which the students got an opportunity to to film what we were what we were doing and we were trying to uh figure out what had been done in haitian cinema before and um and soon after that not because of us but there was a kind of explosion of of haitian um video cinema you know there were a lot of uh, films made um, some of them wonderful, some not so great, but there were a couple of uh, keepers, you know, that like if we were doing this project now, for example, we would have a lot more to work with, you know, with the films of uh, Raoul Peck and, um, and other uh, filmmakers uh, in, inside Haiti. Two final questions. First, let's say our listeners are thinking of doing a trip to Haiti, which by the way, I would recommend strongly. But what tip would you give them for how they can make it somehow manageable and safe, assuming, of course, they're not Haitian? Well, I mean, a lot of people, you know, go to Haiti. Um, and I think you have to go with an open mind, right? And I would say, um, try to get out of Port-au-Prince, um, to go outside, um, go see the countryside. 
Um, there, for example, in the in the the, the south, there's some wonderful um, grottos or caves. There's some hikes. I think there's uh, to not to try to stay in the urban space, but also to go outside. There's um, I think it's Palmer's Guide to both Haiti and the Dominican Republic that has some wonderful tips in terms of um, where to go. And there's some also local um, traveling groups, like try to, try to find a, uh, if you've never been to Haiti and you don't know anybody in Haiti, to try to, to find a, a, um, a, a group to, to, to accompany you. Um, but to go with an open mind, um, to, um, try to learn and listen and, and certainly um, go outside the urban space into, you know, into the countryside. I would, I, would, I would recommend that. And to close, finally, if you could give us one more Haitian proverb that is dear and important to you. Well, this one reminds me very much of um, Jonathan, who, um, though he was not Haitian, we, uh, I probably traveled with him more to Haiti than my own parents when I worked for him. And he always um, used to say, piti piti soiseau fait niche. Little by little, the bird builds its nest. That was his favorite answer to, like, if you ask him how he was doing, um, he would say piti piti soiseau fait niche. And unfortunately, as you know, he passed away not so long ago. And, and um, that was one of his favorites. Um, and that remains very special to me for that reason, but also what the, what the proverb says, it's really, um, it's kind of like that, you know, like that, like every journey begins with one step. And so um, I, I feel like it's, it's good advice these days to piti piti zoazo finish, little by little, the bird builds its nest. Edwidge Tantika, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me.